Welcome to Tentpole Trauma, the podcast where we look at movies that came with hype and high hopes, but left with crushing disappointment, either critically, at the box office, or both. Freed from the weight of expectations, we seek to examine these underperformers under a new light, parsing through the good, the bad, and everything in between with the hopes of gaining a better understanding as to why they failed to find their audience. Warning, there will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie that we're discussing today, I suggest you stop the podcast and go watch it. Then when you come back and listen, you'll get more out of the discussion. On this episode, we discuss the 2015 take on Fantastic Four. Okay, I am Sebastian, and I am here with Jennifer. Hello. And Troy. Hello. This episode, we are discussing 2015's Fantastic Four, or as the legions of fans know it as Fant Four Stick, because that's how the logo makes it look. <laughs> so, yes, this is the infamous 2015 readaptation of the Marvel Comics Fantastic Four characters. As a kid, I was not a big Fantastic Four fan. They were never my superheroes. I always thought they were kind of lame and boring. I was never really a fan of any sort of version of them. I think I watched, there was like a cartoon uh, in the 70s that I might have watched, but I wasn't ever a fan of the comics. Whenever they would show up in the comics, I was pretty bored by them. I did see the really terrible... um, attempt at making it from Corman Studios where they were just trying to hold on to the rights. That actually kind of might be my favorite version of Fantastic Four because it's just silly and cheap. The two movies they made in the aughts, they made one in in 2005 and they made another one a few years later. They were just sort of goofy of that era type comic book movies. I wasn't a big fan of those. And then this version came along. Now, Jennifer, were you aware or in any way a fan of the Fantastic Four? No. <laughs> Troy, were you a fan of Fantastic Four? No. I And, and superheroes in general, I, I kind of approached uh, later. I wasn't ever really that big on, on superhero comics, but I did in college watch the Roger Corman one like on a dare that uh-huh. was actually like a, a pretty popular <laughs> you know in college when you're trying to dig down deep into the barrel and uh yeah you start getting into that stuff so the the Roger Corman one definitely I saw probably a couple times um with some friends well and you could only get that on bootleg videos and stuff it was never officially released yeah so it was pretty fun i think it, at la video in san francisco we we'd find that and then the the other ones i never saw and I, I, I think that those other two were also, I could be wrong, but were also to try to hold the rights yeah. as well. And, and I believe maybe even this one, again, I'm not completely sure, but I feel like it has always kind of been yes. that, that issue yes. to, to maintain these rights for studio reasons. Yes, that is totally the case. 20th Century Fox owned the rights to these characters and the movies that came out, the official movies, like the Corman film, were all basically to hold on to the rights, including this one. I think they were about to run out of the rights in like 2017 or something, so they had to get this out in 2015 for Fox to be able to hold on to it. And the irony being that then a few years later, Fox get bought by Disney anyway. So what they were afraid of happening was that the the Fantastic Four rights would go back to Marvel, and now they're back at Marvel anyway because Disney right. bought Fox. So it's all happened. But at the time, was Marvel already with Disney? They were, right? Marvel had been acquired by Disney, and Disney was producing Marvel films at Correct, this point. at this point, as in 2015, yes. Okay. That is the case. So this film is famously directed by Josh Trank. Josh Trank is a uh, director on the young side. His first major film was Chronicle, and it was a big hit. And off of that movie, he got Fantastic Four. Now, interestingly enough, Troy, 
worked on Fantastic Four. Do you want to explain exactly what your role in this movie was? Yeah, uh, I actually worked on it quite a bit, and I worked on Chronicle. So as we're doing this podcast, I am actually going to approach this in Josh Trank's defense. Cool. Uh, because I kind of was along the ride for the whole thing. Yes. I sort of saw it come to fruition. I was there when it got handed to him. But yeah, I I have a relationship that goes back with Josh uh, all the way to Chronicle. As a storyboard artist, correct? Okay, so what happened with Chronicle is that um, I was a, a visual effects supervisor working for a small company. And Josh came to this company to help actually do a, produce a short he, the studio was already interested. Fox was already, they had already read the script and were very interested in it, which was written by Max Landis and Josh. Well, Josh did the story and I think Max technically wrote the screenplay, but they came to us to produce a short to pitch to the studio to kind of gauge the budget of what they were going to, how they were going to handle this. Right. And I supervised that and I did all the uh, visual effects for that. And then as it went into pre-production, Josh actually took an interest in me boarding out the visual effects sequences. And so I, I actually had a dual role on Chronicle where I handled overseeing a lot of the visual effects for the company we were working with, as well as storyboarding the entire movie. And by doing that, I basically was working one-on-one -on -one with Josh every day before in pre-production and in post-production. So... Josh and I got pretty close. I actually like would drive him home sometimes and hang out with his mom. And so I kind of was on that ride through the whole thing. And after Chronicle kind of exploded, it was kind of a surprise to all of us. Like when I went into the, the first screening of it, I went, you know, I think I went to the Americana and, and saw it. It was just, or no, we they had a special screening for us, for everybody that worked on it. And, uh, Everybody was like, wow, who did that? It was just kind of like, it became bigger than the sum of all its parts. And then Josh became kind of quickly this household name uh, because Chronicle made a lot of people very rich for that worked for Fox. And they basically threw three projects at him after the, uh, you know, all the totals started coming in and it was a, a kind of a, a minor mega hit. And those projects were, I believe, Venom, Fantastic Four, and then one that he actually was more interested in, which was this uh, of Red Star. Mm -hmm. It was uh, based on a, on a video game. I think that's what that was. I remember he was kind of, he was at that point where, what, how do I handle my career? Like, what, what is the right decision to make here? Pretty big crossroads. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he famously chose Fantastic Four, obviously, because we're talking about it. And I remember while the film was in production, there were just these stories coming out of the production that he was, you know, letting his dogs crap all over the apartment they had rented for him. He had sort of withdrawn from filming at one point like he couldn't deal with the pressure of helming such a big project that's the way the stories made it sound is that an accurate representation of what happened okay so on fantastic four what josh ended up doing was once once he did sign on on board with that one i was brought on he actually brought another credit to josh he um brought on his DP from Chronicle. He brought in his editor from Chronicle and he brought in me as the storyboard artist. Everybody could climb up the ladder a little bit with him. But though all those stories are during production. Yeah. And I didn't go to Louisiana right. where they shot that. So I worked on it for about six months at the Fox Studios as a storyboard artist. And there's you know there's a lot of stuff that happened there, but those stories that you're talking about, I couldn't tell you. That was, I wasn't there. I know about as much as you do. You were hearing about it, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hearing about it like everybody else was and starting to get that sinking. Uh, okay, there was already a sinking feeling uh -huh. from pre-production, <laughs> but 
but yeah, once, you know, I was following those stories like everybody else and they, they weren't sounding good. Uh, but I will let you kind of go into to that stuff. You probably followed it even closer than I did. I was pretty fascinated by it. I mean, I obviously I started this podcast because I'm interested in big budget train wrecks. So I saw this one coming just from the stories and that, you know, stories like this don't always mean that the movie's going to be bad. I mean, there's been plenty of movies. Apocalypse Now comes to mind where there were nightmarish productions and all these things going wrong and the movie ends up being great. So I wasn't thinking this definitely means it will be a bad movie, but I was fascinated because the stories were pretty amusing. You know, I mean, nobody got hurt. There was no, you know, it wasn't like the sort of thing where people were being harmed or anything. So, I mean... You know, dogs crapping all over a house or him, you know, not showing up to set because he can't deal with the producers or whatever. That doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not crying for the producers or for (laughs) anybody working on the movie. That sounds funny to me. I'm sure if I was working on it, I'd be like, where's Josh? But, you know, (laughs) I'm not I wasn't working on it. So to me, it was just amusing. But. You know, I was sort of rubbing my hands together in in anticipation of a train wreck. (laughs) I think a lot of people were. uh, There was a lot of people that were already geared to hate this movie. Totally. And I think it was because, well, there's a couple of reasons. This Josh was hired to bring something different to a Marvel project. And already people were not on board with that. Right. There was a a formula that... Uh, had been established and there was a a Marvel universe that was being created that was uh, already making a lot of people happy. And the, you know, the complaints were pretty minor, but it was basically the Marvel universe was kind of building itself on fan, on its fan base and what they wanted. Yeah. And Josh, they hired him because Chronicle took the sort of superhero genre and turned it on its head. And for those of you who have not seen Chronicle, I would, I would definitely check it out. I actually, so I watched Fan Four last night. Oh, <laughs> I needed to cleanse my palate and and put Chronicle back on. I just kind of surfed through it again, and it's incredible. Chronicle is an incredible movie. It is a good movie, but it is dark, and it comes from a very bleak point of view, and it it has a gritty realism to it. That is sort of why they hired him. They said, let's take, you know, let's take this vision and try something different. The problem with that is that I think, you know, that's hard enough to do already in the Marvel universe, but Fantastic Four is probably the one group of superheroes you don't do that with at all. Like they have always been silly, even more than like Spider-Man and, you know, Fantastic Four has been a a ridiculous group of characters from the get-go. Well, they were the original Marvel characters. The Fantastic Four were the first characters Stan Lee created under the Marvel banner. And, you know, they were supposed to be a family. That was the thing. That was, it's like a superhero family. That's the idea at the heart of Fantastic Four. And in fairness to Josh, he wasn't working for Marvel Studios. He was working for Fox Studios. Marvel Studios has Kevin Feige there, and he makes sure that everything is accurate to Marvel Comics as much as they can be. Whereas I think the attitude with Fox was probably like, let's do something different, which is why they hired him. So if he had been working on this under the Marvel banner, it would have been a whole different thing because he just wouldn't have been able to do whatever he wanted to do. He would have been told very strictly what he could do. It's kind of the a situation of being handed the rope to hang yourself with, you know? That's exactly right. And I think he was a little wary of that from the beginning. And and actually, I guess I could jump in to, you know, he, t- he came and told me when he had these projects and he was debating which one he should take. And he was really interested in this video game, to be honest, because I think that was a little bit more, it aligned itself more with what he had done with Chronicle. Mm-hmm. But I remember him being a little worried about that exact sentiment uh, with such a large franchise what would happen if the studio started uh, making demands 
that were different from what he was trying to bring to the table. You know, he had done this one film, so he also wasn't familiar with how that the studio was going to do that. So he was going in a little blind because Chronicle, even though it was 20th Century Fox, it really was handled more as an independent film. Hmm. I don't think it was Fox Searchlight, but it was originally only like $10 million. Right. So it was it was a small project where they kind of let him just do what he wanted to do. All right. Well, I'm sorry, Jen. You've been sort of left out on this. Oh, that's okay. I don't have anything to say. Yeah, I didn't think, I didn't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I didn't even... Um, what I would say, Troy, is I need to check out Chronicle. I didn't see Chronicle. I thought I had seen Chronicle, but I saw Cloverfield. It's a completely different movie. Yeah. Yeah. I was. We were talking about that earlier, and I was like, yeah, I think I saw Chronicle, and I was like, it's in New York with the giant monsters, and yeah, completely different movie. So no, I have not seen Chronicle, so I should check that out. Well, that's understandable. This, you know, they, all these movies came out in the uh, at the peak of actually even a little bit after found footage of the found found footage explosion. So. Yeah. That was very popular, and um, I think both of those movies kind of capped it at that point. These were kind of the last hurrahs of, of that genre. Well, I really liked Cloverfield, and, and then Seb was saying that Chronicle's really good, and I mean, hearing that from you too, and, I, and I've heard good things about it. I just totally blurred them together. That's my own thing. You're not really a superhero fan, so it doesn't really surprise me. No, and, and, and if we're going to be honest about that, because <laughs> I'm really not that big of a superhero fan, I was getting Fantastic Four confused with X Men. I mean, also understandable. I would real talk. Uh, I would uh, <laughs> actually do the same, Jen, if I hadn't been involved with these. All right, I'm hanging up this call. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was like looking up what we we're talking, and I was like, "There's been more than than just a couple other Fantastic Four movies." I'm like, "I just saw that new Mutants movie," and I was like, "Oh, that's not the same thing." No, but they were owned by the same studio. They're all owned by the same studio. I there got confused. There were plans to cross them over. They were going to do a Fantastic Four meets the X-Men because they were both owned at that point by uh, Fox. So you're not that far off. And have like in Deadpool, isn't there Deadpool some... Deadpool was owned by Fox too. Right. But isn't there, aren't there some characters that are coming from these other places like coming from Fantastic Four or X-Men or something that are involved in Deadpool? Deadpool was at Fox so they could use X-Men characters in Deadpool and he is an X-Man. He's an X-Men character. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, so yes, I'm completely confused. It's confusing <laughs> because Marvel is the comic book company that owns all of them, but they sold off all the rights to different studios to because they went bankrupt in the late 90s. So they had to sell off all the rights to different studios. And like Fantastic Four and X-Men ended up at Fox and then Spider-Man ended up at Sony and they all yeah. went all over the place. So what happened was when Marvel Studios became an actual studio, they had all the rights to the characters that they did, which is why we got like a Thor, Captain America and Iron Man movies first, because that's who Marvel owned at the time. And then they became big and powerful and then they bought back their properties or like in the case of Spider-Man, they have a deal with Sony that they can use Spider-Man, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole big thing. But what you're saying is why we have three different Spider-Man. Like we had a Sam Raimi Spider-Man right. and then yes. we had the amazing Spider-Man. Right. And, and it's also why we have these weird uh, Fantastic Four movies. Right. Because of these other studios producing those as, as Marvel was getting this snowball rolling with their franchise these other studios were were trying to build up those and hold on to the rights exactly and they were trying to make their own little pocket universes like sony's mm -hmm. still trying to do that with spider-man you know they're gonna have spider-man and venom and all these other characters i appreciate and honor this mansplaining because i asked for it and i need it <laughs> so thank you Be because um you know i only know Certain, like the the big Marvel characters and the big DC characters. No, no, no. I, let I, me, let, Jen, listen, listen. L <laughs> let me explain this. <laughs> let me explain this to you. I should know. I come from the studio that that handled this project. I'm sorry. What were you saying, Jen? That's right, Troy. Tell me. No, I, and also I think my lack of knowledge, and we will this will become well more well known throughout the podcast, is actually a, a plus. 
for this Fantastic Four film because I don't have a dog in this fight at all. I don't care. I don't know who's who. I have no idea. I mean, I can understand if I was a fan and I had read the comics, I would be much more invested, much more concerned about studios and this and that and the other and what's going on and, and you know, all of that. But I don't care. I do enjoy like straight up superhero films. I really just enjoyed actually uh, the um, Captain America and Winter Soldier, which I kept saying. And th- what did I keep saying? Captain America. It's Falcon and, the- and Winter oh. Soldier. <laughs> Yeah, the, I kept Sorry saying, to mansplain. I, no, but you're right, because I kept saying it was Falcon and, and the Winter Snowman is what I kept saying. Because <laughs> it was like, all I could think is Falcon and the Snowman. That's what my brain was saying. Falcon and the Winter That's Soldier. That's the porn version. Yes, it's dirty, <laughs> dirty. But I really enjoyed that. And I actually told was telling Seb, I like this even better than Marvel movies. And it's because it's more character driven. And it's also because it's not so damn long. Like, I don't need to have battle fatigue. Like, I don't need battles that go on forever. Um, I I need a little bit of action, but I actually like to know more about the characters. I am kind of on board with that as well, Jen. I kind of come from a similar place. Like, I I love the character development in superhero films. That's why I always kind of... I always looked back at at Richard Donner's Superman as kind of my first favorite superhero film because it spent a nice slow progression of him growing up uh, in Kansas and, you know, and I, or Smallville, sorry, but, you know, I I liked that. And then I I check out when it just becomes a battle at that point on. So I totally check out. Batman versus Superman. Your hatred of Batman versus Superman is on record. We've got it. I know it's, you know what? I know it's my avatar and I'm okay with that. (laughs) On this note, so when Josh was handed uh, these projects, before any of this stuff went into pre-production at all, he actually hired me uh, just to kind of, you know, have these conversations and start doing some, some rough concept art. And uh, we were talking a lot about this, about characters and, and what a superhero is and what it means to, to gain powers. And we'd been having these conversations in Chronicle. That's a big part of what Chronicle is, is, you know, what would that really be like to, to have super, super powers like this, especially at a young age where you can be kind of destructive and, and you know, riddled with teen angst. And, uh, you know, how a big of a Cronenberg fan I am. Yeah. You can mm-hmm. vouch for that. I actually brought up, you know, body horror and how I thought the fly was kind of an interesting template for an alternative superhero, like an anti superhero. Monsters yeah. can be close cousins with, with superheroes. And we were actually kind of having conversations about uh, the fly and the dead zone and being stricken with this almost cursed with a power that then you would have to deal with in your body. How kind of could that could be frightening at first and then slowly have to learn how to, to use it for something else. And it appears that that stuck. Yeah. That's in this movie. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It is in there. I really noticed while watching it this time that the fly element is there big time. Yeah, I mean, it's about a teleporting device, Mm -hmm. which is exactly what the fly is about. So um, Fantastic Four 2015 begins in 2007, which was shocking to see as a 45-year-old when I saw this in the theater that 2007 was considered a long time ago. And we meet young Reed Richards. He's at school talking about his science project that he's going to make, which is basically this quantum teleporter that will become a real thing later on. And he's being made sort of fun of by his classmates and his teacher, who's played by Homer Simpson's Dan (laughs) Castellaneta. Certainly, I will say the first half of the movie, I like a lot more than the second half of the movie. But I do struggle a little bit with this opening. And it's mainly because I feel like this little kid who's playing Reed Richards has been instructed to play him as somebody on the spectrum And he kind of sounds like a robot when he's sitting there talking. He's like, yes, and my teleporter will do this and that or whatever. And everybody's like, ha, ha, ha. The kid that's playing young Ben Grimm, who will become his best friend, is a little bit better. But this kid playing Reed Richards seems to be struggling with it. Now, Troy, 
was, do you know, did Josh have this concept that Reed was going to be someone on the spectrum? He may, he may have, but I don't remember that ever being specific. I mean, he definitely was trying to create this outcast. Absolutely. You know, right. and I think he was kind of fetishizing outcasts in general. I thought it was fine. I, I didn't have any, I didn't read, read to be anything other than just a, a, a kid that's obsessed with science. So yeah, he makes friends with Ben Grimm, who lives in like a junkyard with his mean brother who tells him he's going to clobber him. So they form this sort of unlikely friendship. I definitely got sort of a Spielbergian vibe from this section. Yep. I think you're right about the Spielbergian vibe. He, he had brought up Explore. And simultaneously, when we were talking about The Fly, he was also talking about that film Explorers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think he was trying to he was trying to do something where he was like combining those two films. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. And, which Explorers was sort of a byproduct of that era, that Spielberg era. I I don't remember if it was it wasn't a Robert Zemeckis movie, but it, it, it kind of came from that, you know, little kids building something extraordinary and having wild adventures. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're dead on about that. So then we jump seven years later and we're in high school and we get this scene where uh, older Reed Richards, who I guess is 18 or 19 or 8, 17 at this point, played by Miles Teller. Now, Miles Teller is an actor I saw in, um, what's the drummer movie? Whiplash. Whiplash. He's good in that. He's been a good in a few other things, but I'm not really a huge fan of his. I think he does a fine job as Reed. He's somewhat endearing, but he's also a little off-putting. I like him, um, and I thought he was great as Reed. I will go ahead and say now, I really like the entire cast. So I was I was happy with everyone they chose, and I was happy to see. I was like, oh, yeah, it's that. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen. I remember them, and yeah, so it was... All pleasant surprises to me. I think Miles Teller is is like one of the up you know pe- people who out there are like a, a rare talent that I would like to see more of. Actually, I think he's pretty incredible, um, and I think he was right for exactly what this version of of Reed Richards was supposed to be. And as far as the, you know, the rest of the cast. Uh, I pretty much like everybody in it. The only the only character that I felt was a little didn't quite fit and and just struggled with was uh, the the villain, the main corporate, the guy who was running the military mm-hmm. facet. Right, you're talking about Tim Blake Nelson as Doctor Allen. Yeah, I like the rest of the cast a lot. We get Jamie Bell as Ben Grimm, and he's sort of an unconventional choice for the Ben Grimm character because he's actually kind of a smaller stature guy. And, of course, Ben Grimm becomes this giant hulking rock. And we have Kate Mara as Sue Storm. Love her. I am a fan of hers. Yeah, I've seen her in a lot of good things. But I like all the cast pretty much. And this scene is kind of fun. It's a science fair at the high school. And they've gone ahead and made this updated version of this transporter device. But it blows out the power grid or whatever and freaks everybody out. Oh, no, he teleports like some kid's little toy plane to some other dimension. But nobody believes him that the device actually works, so they lose the science fair. But they do get recruited by Franklin Storm, who's played by Reg E. Kathy or Kathy, and he's from The Wire. I love him. So good. Yeah, me too. I I loved hearing that guy's voice. Oh, so like good. A really just good voice. Listen to that guy talk forever. You said it was a fun moment. Yeah. I never saw any of this as fun. <laughs> I don't know. I they're definitely trying to be lighthearted in this scene because you know he takes the yeah the plane and tr- it, you know they, it's well then he and he breaks the they, they break the glass on the backboard of the basketball. That's true, right. Yeah. There's humor in here. They're yeah. trying to have humor, for sure. I don't think a lot of it works, honestly. It's sort of this deadpan type of humor. Yeah, that's kind of how I received most of the, the opening. I just It just kind of felt like there, there was a lot of sadness around all of this. And, and I know it was kind of playing for comedy at some times, but 
yeah, I'm not quite sure how much that came across. Do you think that the original vision of it was darker, but maybe Josh was pressured to lighten things up a little bit? Well, yeah. So I can kind of jump in a little bit about that. So there was a whole vision that Josh had from the very beginning. You know, I there was there was a, a whole entire script written about this, and uh, yeah, I was he definitely was trying to trying to bring over what he did in Chronicle and and make it into this, and I was not in these meetings, but there started very quickly, I think, to be a back and forth as the studio got a little bit cold feet with how that was playing out. I, I, were, I boarded out stuff from an early script, but prior to that, uh, there was, you know, they had been doing preliminary outlines and stuff for, for even like a year before that. There was a, there was a whole different movie originally that was going to happen. You know, I think this is not something that's that's uncommon in in studio situations like this where there suddenly is uh, you know, another writer was brought on the producer Simon Kinberg. Simon Kinberg came in and Simon started writing stuff and there was a, a bit of, you know, differences of opinions in what this was supposed to be and I think what the studio ultimately wanted. And this is kind of where I am holding on to Josh's defense a little bit, because uh, if you have seen Chronicle, like I said, it's sort of a dark take on a, a buddy movie, superhero kids kind of thing, and, and a family too, like a group of friends. And I know that there was a back and forth as to the spectrum of what degree these things were going to be played out. And, and it went from one end completely to the other and then completely back and then to the other. There were these dark elements that were talked about and then there would be rewrites and then suddenly like Reed Richards was turning into a silly parachute and like jumping out of planes and, you know, saving people and and just becoming almost like Plastic Man. You know, the tone of this thing, and this is kind of what we're, we're getting into with these parts, is a little schizophrenic. Well, I mean, I think you can clearly see later on scenes that, I mean, there and there's a dead giveaway. We'll get to it when we get there. But you can see there are scenes that have been added that are totally trying to fix things and patch things up. But let's let's get there when we get there. So after this, Reed Richards gets recruited into the Baxter University laboratories. It's a little confusing the way it's laid out in the story because it's like he's being accepted into college, but really he's being brought in to work on this big project. I find that a lot of the sort of details, the connective details in this movie are really fudgy and hard to follow just because you're like, what? So is he being brought into a college or is he being brought in to work on a science project? They're not the same thing. You don't go to college and then immediately start working on some giant high tech project. Well, Franklin, Franklin says to him at the science fair, you, I'm giving you a scholarship to right. Baxter College. So a scholarship would mean that you're going to be a student there. Yeah, but there's no classes. Right. Yeah, we never <laughs> yeah. see him in class. We see him in the library. Yeah. There's a cute scene where he talks to Sue in the library, and we learn the thing that we're going to see her do later, which is that she looks for patterns and things, and yeah. she she does it with her headphones on, which music helps music. her see patterns yeah. and things. But that's about it for as far as normal college goes. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're right. It's a. Str- it's seems. A lot more like their employees immediately. Yes. Which is weird that they're calling, instead of just saying, we're hiring you, he says, we're going to give you a scholarship, and then he's working. Well, and I think that's a kind of strange problem with the script, because why did they feel the need to go from high school right into this? Why couldn't they have just jumped to them being young adults and working in a lab? Why did it have to go through high school? I don't understand that. They're not all so young looking that they couldn't be post grads or whatever why is i don't understand the time jump it's a strange time jump to be all right this is seven years later since they were little kids and he's in high school at a high school science fair and now he's going into college but he's really working you know what i mean like why not just have him be a young guy who's already gone through college why are we doing this it's a strange story choice that doesn't really work at all you're seeing piecemeal of different script versions so 
you know, I'm not saying anything that's not out there on the internet, but, and you can clearly see it in the film, like exactly what you're saying. Things aren't adding up properly. So these sequences feel oddly stitched together where the, the, the connective tissue isn't really there. Yeah. And now we're just in this seg other segment of the film and you're like, how did we get here? Wait, weren't we just in high school? two scenes ago yeah. and now we're building teleporters to other dimensions. <laughs> That's a pretty big leap. I noticed that Kate Mara's hair looked different. Like, I, I mean, I know later <laughs> <Yes>. on, <laughs> yeah, well, later on she has, you know, obviously when time has passed, she has longer hair, but like seriously yeah. from the library to the lab, it was different hair. Yep. And I was like, you know why? I, I maybe she was working on something else and she didn't have that hair anymore. Yes. They came back to do major reshoots, and the project that she was on was a project that she had cut her hair short for. So she had to mm. go back and reshoot a bunch of scenes. And so when she's in those scenes, she's clearly wearing a wig. Wearing a it wig. It does not look yeah. like the ha hair that she was had before. No. And it's like painfully obvious. Yeah. So you can really clearly see the scenes that have been shot to stitch stuff together because all you got to do is look for her wig. And you're like, okay. oh, that's a reshoot. Which I was I was noticing a lot more on this screening that I just did because I remember you know this rumor had gotten out before the film was released. Yeah. By the way, Seb Seb and I we we saw this together. I when think it I was remember that. Released that's right in the theater. I was all jazzed about. I got to be your plus one. Yeah, that's right. And I remember looking for that wig and definitely seeing it in the theater, but. When I just saw this again recently, I, I realized how much this this movie is just back and forth with this wig through like the entire movie. Yeah. Early on, like she comes in there, like you said, Jen, she's in one room and she walks in the other and then she's got this completely different color and different thickness to her hair. Yeah. And I, I knew nothing about any of that. I knew nothing about the reshoots or anything. So I, I just noticed today, I was like, it's the first time I've seen it. And I was <laughs> just, and I wanted to say something to Sebastian, but I was like, no, I'll save it for the podcast. He didn't brief you on the, the famous wig <laughs> before you started watching it? Nope. I wanted to save it for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so two more important characters that we meet in this segment are Toby Klebel as Victor Von Doom. Now, I remember they had planned to change the name of the character Victor Von Doom into something that didn't sound ridiculous, like they gave him just some normal name that kind of sounded like Von Doom, but the nerds got so angry that they had to change it back to Victor Von Doom. So you can't blame Josh Trank for that because he wanted to call him something else. So Toby Klebel, he's famous for playing one of the evil apes in one of the Planet of the Apes sequels. And he's in the show Servant recently. He usually plays some kind of slimy character. He's mm -hmm. usually a villain. So it's pretty clear um, up front that he's our villain. And if you know the character of Doctor Doom, you know he is the villain of the Fantastic Four. And true to the story of the Fantastic Four, he starts off as a friend. So, you know, in this case, he's sort of the frenemy He's this other genius who was formerly working for Baxter, but he went off on his own because he didn't like their rules or whatever. And now he's being coerced back into the game. And the other character is Johnny Storm, who is played by Michael B. Jordan. Now, one of the I wouldn't say controversial elements of the casting here, but they were going for obviously going for something different because, you know, in the story of the Fantastic Four, Sue and Johnny are brother and sister, and they're both blonde Aryan types. And here they decided to make the character of Ben Franklin, the father, a person of color, and Johnny is his natural son, and he's a person of color, and it's actually Sue who's adopted, and she's white. And they have a sort of backstory explanation for that, that she was a Kosovo kid or something. Mm -hmm. I think it's a cool little twist to make things a little more inclusive. Um, and Michael B. Jordan has gone on to become a pretty big star after this. He did the Creed films and Black Panther. He is a really great presence and a great physical 
actor and stuff. I do feel he is pretty much wasted in this movie, although I think he does fine. This movie does not highlight how great Michael B. Jordan is. I would say, though, that he is one of the, the few people that when he's when he's on screen, you're just like, oh, thank you. Like, <laughs> at least like there's Michael B. Jordan who can you just feel a little bit more spontaneity with him and a little yeah. more like natural like he just seems to to carry his natural acting ability a little more comfortably yeah whereas uh, again like who knows if it was a a style choice or if it was uh fraught uh, circumstances on set but it's safe to say that like everybody in this is playing ice cold right and then with a few exceptions is when you see Michael B Jordan come on screen and he just seems to be breathing differently than everybody else. Well, the character of Johnny is supposed to be hot-headed, which is, you know, why he turns into the human torch. There's a, supposed to be a metaphor at play for all of the characters like Reed stretches himself too thin, which is why he becomes <laughs> stretchy, and Johnny's a hothead, which is why he turns into fire and and Sue feels like nobody pays attention to her, so that's why she turns invisible. I mean, these are the 1960s metaphors we're talking about. That's not really present in this movie they're going for something else and rightfully so because those ideas are sort of outdated but that's why the characters have the powers that they have and so johnny is supposed to be the hot tempered one and they get that across with the michael b jordan character he's a good choice for that kind of character and he you know he he's like drag racing at the beginning of the movie so we see that he's a thrill seeker or whatever he was also one of the first things that uh, Josh wanted to do because he was coming from Chronicle. Michael B. Jordan right. was in Chronicle. And uh, I think one of the first demands that Josh made was he was like, I want, I want Michael in this movie as Johnny Storm. I think that Chronicle can be attributed to Michael B. Jordan becoming a movie star. Before that, yeah. he was mostly known for being on the wire as a kid and he was great on that, but you know he he changed a lot from being Wallace on the wire mm. to becoming the character in Chronicle and and what he later became. So it was a big jump. Yeah. Jen, how do you feel about Michael B. Jordan? I love him. You know, I love him. I know. And I, yeah, and I was stoked to see him show up here. And again, I am very pleased with the entire cast of this film. It was it was good. I think he's he's great, and I'm just always happy to see him. You know, for the most part, I like the characters fine. I think that the production design looks pretty good. I feel like the scenes more or less work. You know, they're not exceptional or anything, but they're on the level of like a Spider-Man movie or whatever. You know, we're getting that same sort of young people dealing with science stuff, you know. So and like we get this whole montage of them working on the the quantum teleporter and we're seeing them sort of become friends. Are you invested in these characters the way you would in other superhero movies? No, not necessarily. No, I don't hate them. I don't love them. I feel sort of indifferent to them. I kind of am uh, a little bit. I mean, I really, I thought there were some moments and I'm backing up a little bit, but when uh, Reed and Ben go to Baxter and, you know, he's like, it's kind of sad for Ben because they're kind of splitting up, you know, even though yeah. Reed's like, I, I'm not that, I'm just a train right away or whatever. Like I really am. I believe their friendship. And then when, when Reed is, you know, takes a selfie in front of the, the equipment he's working on, he sends it to Ben. Yeah, who's back funny. at the, back at the junkyard, you know, and he gets this, like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, buddy. I got a little like, Oh, you know, I, 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 it was working for me. Like their friendship was working for me. I don't find this movie to be fun in any way. And I don't mean that as a, <laughs> as a put down. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that was, if they were trying to do that, but it's not, I wouldn't call this movie fun. I mean, it's no. not, a, it's not, it's not a, a slog by any means, or it's not, you know, it's not, not entertaining, but it's not, when I think of fun, I think more of Avengers, you know, that type yeah. of fun. This is, it's more lighthearted. This feels darker and I'm fine with that. The The only kind of fun that I see actually happening is a one brief moment where 
Kate Mara and Reed are uh, Sue and Reed are like kind of laughing and Victor is like leering at them because they're having a good time. And then he like lectures Reed, you know, you're not being professional because he's yeah. obviously jelly because they're, you know, they're getting along. But it's like, that's when I kind of in my head, I was like, there will be no fun here. Like it's a total killjoy at work. You know, that person that's like, there's no, no room for fun. But I, I just, I don't know. I, I think it's about the relationships with these people. Sure. But I, I mean, the, the tightest one really, I think is Reed and Ben, to be honest. I mean, yeah. you know, Sue yeah. is kind of like, you know, a little bit of a kind of interest, love interest, maybe for Ben and Victor kind of crushing on her. I don't know. There's some stuff going on there. And then Michael B. Jordan's got stuff going on with his dad. And, you know, there's there's stuff happening. But I care enough. I think you explained that perfectly. <laughs> that, <there's, laughs> that first of all, that would you say it's not fun? <laughs> You know, and then and then as you're summing up what's happening with the other characters is they kind of have some stuff going here and some stuff going there, but you don't really know what those things are. Yeah. And I remember when Seb and I came out of the theater seeing this for the first time, like we just kind of like <laughs> took a deep sigh. And like the one word that sort of summed it up for us was like, God, that was just joyless. <laughs> yeah. They do end up completing this quantum teleporter device. And one little moment of fun is they, they're they celebrating the completion of this device. And uh, Michael B. Jordan goes to fist bump Miles Teller. And <laughs> Miles Teller just sort of slaps his hand awkwardly. That was hilarious. You weren't laughing at that? that? Okay. Yes. That was a good gag. You're right. Well, he's like trying to high five his fist bump. And yeah. You're right. That was actually a gag that sort of showed who their characters were. Johnny is is this kind of, uh, like you said, hot-headed, you know, very co overly confident. And uh, Reed is awkward and does not understand human interaction at all. So they complete this device and the idea is that they're going to get to go into this other dimension. They've discovered this other dimension and now that they have this teleporter, they're going to all get to be astronauts and go off into this other dimension. But then the government stooges run who are Tim Blake Nelson is the head government stooge, Dr. Allen. They all show up and are like, well, we're going to give this over to NASA now, which who told these scientists that they were going to get to be the astronauts and go off into this other dimension? Like who was the idiot who told them that they could do that? <laughs> like, why would you even tell them they could do that? Of course, they're not going to let them do that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone particularly told them that they could. But I mean, well, kind of, I think Franklin was kind of like, yep, you know, because wait, back up. Super tense moment for me was when we sent the cute little chimp off. Oh, I right, was like, yeah. I was like, what? No, like this is going to end in tears. The but painfully thank CGI chimp. Yeah, and... I know, whatever. But he comes back and it's fine. And then I think Franklin kind of was like, play your cards, right? You guys are next. It was kind of something like that where he kind of like made them think like they would get to go if things were okay with the chimp, I think. I, I am a little disappointed. I'm sorry, Jen. That chimp scene didn't go full the fly. <laughs> <laughs> if it was already edging towards that. Jen was like, oh, no, when they yeah. put the chimp yeah. in the thing because no. she's feeling like it was going to all go badly. <laughs> that was going to go really badly. <laughs> it looked like it was heading there. I just want to say that that chimp was really egregiously CG, though. Yes. So I didn't yeah. really feel anything for the chimp because it was very clearly not no, a it, real chimp. It looked like a cartoon yeah. version of a chimp. And I should say that there's a big difference here in terms of the comic book story and what's in this movie. Because in the comic book, all they do is like Reed Richards builds a rocket ship and they go up into space and they get bombarded by these cosmic rays. And that's just way too simplistic now for modern audiences. And plus, they did that in the aughts movies or whatever. So I appreciate that they're trying to do something different here. And it's that they've discovered this other dimension that they're going to call Zero Planet or whatever. Planet Zero. Yeah. Planet Zero, they all get drunk and decide that they're going to go on this mission anyway, and they're going to do it without the government knowing. So Reed decides that he's got to have his 
unqualified friend Ben Grimm to come along <laughs> to like watch his back or whatever. This is a stretch. <laughs> right. This is like really irresponsible because now you're like suiting up your working class buddy who literally knows nothing about this kind of thing, but whatever. We're, we'll move past that. But what kind of sucks is because they only have four pods to take you into the other dimension. And so... It's Ben, Reed, Johnny, and Victor are going. And, like, Sue gets totally left behind. She doesn't get to go on this mission. It's like they're, like, bros before hoes or whatever. They don't even ask her to go. Doesn't she come in and, and find out after they've already yes. left? And, yes. and she, yeah. like, kind of has to go, oh, the, I should try to get them back. Yes. And she just jumps in there and starts typing on the keyboard really fast. I just kind of thought that they were under the impression that Sue wouldn't be down to do this. Kind of, I didn't think they left her out. I mean, it was, you know, kind of unfortunate the way it went down, but I, I kind of thought that's like, because when she comes in and she's like, oh my God, you know, like they went and did this. No, I, I think that you're right, but the movie doesn't give you that information. No, no. I think you're doing the work for the movie in that case. I do think you're right. I think they were like, oh, Sue wouldn't want to come or, or Sue's, you know, not going to be down to break the rules to this extent. But that's not set up in the movie. So you can't really give that to the movie. Another thing that's rather disappointing. <laughs> so they get into the machine and they go to Zero Planet. And when they get to Zero Planet, it's just a big world full of rocks. <laughs> and this looks like they just borrowed this wholesale from another movie or something it's really uninteresting and it's n like you're like all oh, right i'm going to another dimension and it's like <laughs> a dimension of rocks and sand and a cliff it's like a <laughs> bummer uh i can say that it was last minute so there were bigger plans for what this other dimension was going to look like you know the, josh had actually written a, a script where there was like an entire battle in New York and there was, there was like these entirely, there was all these other things happening and you know, there was a lot of script changes, but I think that there was still s scripts being written and rewritten by different people. Yeah. And they had this soundstage booked and they had to shoot that. They basically had to start doing scenes where they didn't really have, they didn't know what it was going to look like yet. So most of this was sort of shot on a green screen? Oh, it was all green screen, which is which is how you would do it anyways. But I think that it had to be basically, it had to just go into production with a very general uh, landscape to just shoot it where it could basically be anything behind them. What that place was came a lot later okay after they had been shooting it and then a, a lot of these were reshoots and stuff so it definitely seems like an afterthought like i'm not blown away by this no. other dimension if this is the other dimension i'm not interested in it it's boring i don't really have a problem with how this other dimension looks i think it's kind of a bummer that we don't get to see more of it like they just barely get in there and they have to get out i don't know i wasn't bothered with the way it looks i mean if we're talking other dimensions, just of something recently, um, which we loved, I, I loved um, Kong versus Godzilla, and we're in another dimension there, we get to see a... That dimension's way cooler. It is way cooler, but we also... That was the middle of the earth. Okay, well, whatever. Totally different, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, you know, whatever. It's like, we got to see a lot more of that, is what I'm saying. Like, we got to really cruise through that area. Like, they barely get out of their pods and like they rappel down this cliff or whatever, and then everything goes to shit. Yeah. So th that's all we get. There's this like pulsating green energy that's coming out of the ground that's going to be some sort of antimatter something or other that's going to be the big world destroying element. And Victor, of course, is like, I'm going to go touch it because that's what every stupid scientist does in, in a movie to get infected with something. That's a Prometheus is, move. Right. That's a total Prometheus <laughs> move. And so he gets sort of infected with this green power goo or whatever. And then... 
they have to go racing back to the their ship or whatever you want to call it, the Trelleporter. Does the ship have a name? It's the Quantum something or right. other. I'm just calling it the Quantum Teleporter, but I don't think that's what they call it. It's Quantum something. Right. But again, not a very interesting ship. It's pretty boring. It's just... A bunch of pods that you step into and they're not even cool like the pods in the fly Mm -hmm. they just look like stasis tubes or the things in alien where the the, the sleeper sleeper pods sleeper pods i mean and i and i do kind of have a problem with that about this movie is that there seems to be not a lot of imagination going on in that regard like everything looks just sort of i mean maybe it's trying to look grounded scientifically but at the same time like you're making a movie where we're going into other dimensions don't try too hard to like ground this in a reality especially when you're like you're bringing the guy who works at a junkyard along for the ride (laughs) it's a (laughs) bit of a missed opportunity too when they have to rebuild it and it basically just looks even more boring (laughs) right it's more of like a i don't know it's the 2018 model of a 2016 car right exactly and i think even is it um reed who says like you made it ugly or one of one of them actually says like oh you made it ugly or you made it boring or something like that he comments on the way it was boring to begin (laughs) with reed they lose victor he falls to his quote unquote death and they come back in the malfunctioning quantum teleporter there's rocks being sucked into it as they're trying to go back and the the fire erupts into johnny's pod so you know we're getting this setup of what their powers are going to be when they come back through as you guys said sue is on the other side overriding the protocol or whatever to get them back and they come back in a big explosion And Sue is rushing to help and gets hit in a wave of the explosion. So that's how she gets her powers. And we get what I think is probably the best scene in the movie. The aftermath of the pod coming back through and the explosion and reads on the ground and he's crawling through the wreckage and he looks up and he sees Johnny who's on fire. He hears Ben crying out for help, but all he can see is this big rock pile ahead of him. And as he's pulling himself through the wreckage, he doesn't realize that his foot is still caught in the machine. And he turns back and he sees that he's stretched out really far. And at that point, I heard Jen Jen go, really? Or something (laughs) like that. (laughs) Yeah, Jen, how did this part of the film grab you? Because... It's definitely the the horror part. I know. I really liked this. I just, I have no, I have nothing to base any of this on. So I had no idea what was happening and what it, what was going on. I mean, you know, obviously I knew something was happening to these characters, but I didn't know, I don't know who these characters are. So I wasn't like, oh, this is when he becomes fireman or what, like torch, torch, human, human torch. torch. You know, I, I didn't torch. have that frame of reference to be like, oh, you know, like if I was a fan, I'd be like, oh, this is, this is when their origin, this is how it's happening. Yeah. So that was my response. I, I thought it was really cool with Reed, but I was like, whoa, really? Like that's, I, I didn't, I, I don't know the characters well enough to know that there's like a rubber man or stretch man or what was he called? Is he rubber man? He's called Mr. Fantastic. Okay. It, it, don't, okay. Don't, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, so I, I, I like the scene. I think it's cool. Yeah. I think it's kind of funny that you, you're comparing, you know, these characters, these 1960s characters with like human torch, Mr. Fantastic and invisible girl. And you get this scene Right. <laughs> Contrasted with, with the, you know, the origins of those characters. And this was truly meant to be a moment of horror. It was very deliberate to make this something that was scary. The, even the soundtrack, you have these screeching violins, I think at this point, and his face is bloody. There's this, mo- every, people, looks like Ben's dead, but there's just moaning coming from rocks. And Reed just has this, his glasses are broken. He looks like he's all cut up. and His helmet's all like rusted in too. Like, I mean, he's definitely bloody mess yeah, for sure. Yeah, and we're not so much seeing that he's stretching as much as it just looks like his, it's definitely that body horror moment when if you were running 
you know, somewhere and, and, or, or swimming in the water and you felt something cut your leg and you don't know how bad you're cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can't feel it yet. And it's that moment when or like you've fallen and you don't realize how badly you've broken your leg and you look down and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. So it's that moment. And it's, it's very deliberate with what they're trying to do. And it's it's pretty gruesome. Well, and this vibe carries over into the next sequence, which takes place in Area 57. Ha ha. Not Area 51. Um, It's sort of a big you know, lab in the middle of nowhere and where secret projects are, are taken to be dealt with by the government. And Reed wakes up and he's on this stretcher, or, you know, he's on like an operating table, but they've got him all stretched out. And this is where we're really seeing the result of what's happened to them. We're seeing that uh, Sue on a table and and Franklin is there and they're explaining to him that you know, she's going in and out of invisibility and, you know, Sue Storm's power is that she can turn invisible and she can also create uh, force fields. And we see Johnny is all on fire, but he's still alive. And Reed is lying on the table and he hears Ben crying out to him in this ventilator shaft, through this ventilator shaft. And so Reed gets off the table and climbs into the vent and because he can stretch, and I appreciated this because I get annoyed in movies when characters just find vents, air vents they can just <laughs> climb into conveniently. He does. Because when I was a kid, I really wanted to climb into an air vent, and they're always too small. Like, you, air vents are hard to fit in. They don't usually make them that big. But he, because he can stretch, he was able to go into this air vent. And he goes into where Ben's cell is and sees that Ben has now become this rock creature, the thing. This version of the thing, it's important to point out, does not wear little blue undies like the character does in the comics. So we're getting raw thing all the time. And although we, we don't see his rock penis... You feel its presence. There's a rock there that's a little bigger than some of the others in the growing area. Yeah, there's no undies on this thing. No. I, I noticed that, though, that there's there's a shape. Yeah. You, you are getting somewhat of a shape. So we're seeing the thing's thing. That's right. That's what you're saying. Now, the visual effects here are really coming into play, obviously, with these powers. And I think they're passable if not great like the human torch does not look as cool as i feel like he should he looks very cg the thing i'm not really crazy about the design of the thing he looks more of something like you'd see in like a fantasy movie rather than the actual character of the thing the character of the thing in the comics has these really pronounced brows. Like, eyebrows and it's kind of like the main thing about the character, and they just decided not to go that way with this, and it, he just doesn't look good. The invisibility stuff is fine, but it's pretty typical. And the stretching stuff, it's really hard to do stretching effects that don't look goofy. I think they do a pretty good job in this movie, considering like the stretching effects that they had in the other Fantastic Four movies are terrible. So these are like better than that, but overall... Better than the Roger Corman one where he like well, way reaches better, yeah. off to the side of the <laughs> yeah. screen and then yeah. you get a cutaway of like a long arm on a broomstick. Yeah, totally. That's literally <laughs> what happens in that yeah. movie. You know, it's they're okay. They're fine. They're passable, but not great. When we were talking about these, what their powers were, it, it was kind of exciting to rethink these things because like you said these are these are really cartoonish powers from the 60s and i don't know if it really showed up in in the film but the the idea was basically that they're inflicted with these things and they're out of these their control they can't control them instead of the design i think more at attention and the character's design more attention went into their suits and their right. suits were more practical. Yeah, their containment suits is what they say. Yeah, and that was a, a a big concept way early on. That was it seemed at the time pretty exciting. Um, where Richard originally I think was not going to be able to even control how much he was stretching or what being able to move properly, but the suit would be able to contain him, and then that would work into the suit design. And the same with the Human Torch, which I like that idea, but that's 
barely in the movie. I don't get yeah. that sense in the movie. In the movie, they just look like kind of black suits, and they do say it. You know, and, and like Johnny Storm's suit has like a little grate on the chest, but it's not like I love the idea you're describing to me. But in the actual movie, it doesn't really translate that way. It, it didn't translate. And and they got uh, basically kind of softened down. There were some designs that were more like deep sea diver suits. They were like big, bulky things with ribs right. and stuff that would have been more like you know, some biomechanic thing that they yeah. would have had to wear. But, you know, you're you're basically still trying to make them look like Marvel superheroes. Yes. Not not deep sea divers from <laughs> what the seventeenth century or something. <laughs> so it got muddled. This is sort of a perfect example of the way dealing with these beloved IPs and trying to bring in people who have really interesting creative ideas is going to run into problems. Yeah. Because you can't move too far away from what makes the Fantastic Four the Fantastic Four. But at the same time, you want somebody to bring something fresh to it. It's like you can't do both. And I think that's the real rub at the heart of this thing. It's too bad because the ideas that you're describing to me sound like a really interesting superhero movie and i don't care if it's the fantastic four or not you know call them something else give them different powers you take that idea and do something interesting with it but unfortunately the way the yeah. industry works is it's all got to be centered around these billion dollar properties and you've got to stick to what the fans want so you really run into problems again is like why a film like chronicle works so well because you're just taking you know, like I said, like really generic ideas about superheroes and, and then you're doing that very thing. And you can because they they don't have a, a franchise attached to them. Yeah, they are. They're not these established characters. They're simply the idea of superheroes. But unfortunately, you can't tweak a property like that and then have it be something completely else and still call it that property. You're not going to be able to sell tickets and have people come see the Fantastic Four if they don't even resemble the Fantastic Four. And I think this is too much of a push and pull, and the, the tug of war kind of just canceled itself out. The tug of war broke, like the rope broke in the middle and both sides fell into the mud. That's what happened here. Yeah. Unless you're me and you have no touchstone for what the Fantastic Four is. Yeah, well, you're the ideal viewer, honestly, for this movie. <laughs> as long as you can get me in the theater, because you didn't get me in the theater in 2015. I remember you guys went to see it, but yeah. that w it wasn't, I, I didn't feel the need to see it at the time. Sorry, but I, but it was fine watching it today. And what was, I was just remembering, what was that film that did kind of do this, that was supposed to be Superman, but not really Superman, that he was evil and an alien bright burn bright burn I, I you know i i never saw it but that was another attempt where you're alluding to a yes. character but not naming it specifically but yeah. it's basically superman so i think that's that's where you can cross that that line and get away with it we saw bright burn in the theater and i enjoyed it i can't remember how you felt about it i liked it okay i thought it was yeah, okay i thought it was good I thought it delivered on its premise, which was kind of a trailer premise. Evil Superman. So after this, basically, Reed escapes and Ben agrees to work for the government. Then we jump to one year later. And up to this point, the movie has been average, not great, but I don't actively dislike it. But that's all over now. <laughs> Because <laughs> once we go to one year later, this movie falls apart like a cheap fucking suit. And it like it literally unravels before your eyes until it becomes nothing. And it all starts here. And all of a sudden, all these things are thrown at you. None of them make any fucking sense. And like the things connecting them are non-existent. Ben is working for secret ops, okay? So he's going around the world for whatever reason he's decided that he's okay to do this. He's going around the world and, like, killing people. They show that he's got, like, 41 <laughs> confirmed kills. Like, he's destroying tanks or whatever, and we just see this footage of him fucking shit up. And Tim Blake Nelson's, like, at a conference, like, proud of his new, you know, murder rock man <laughs> and i also want to add to that like this is the moment where 
after we've established what their powers are, we should be starting to experiment with them and see them come to fruition. And the only way we see that the, the thing is the one that's active right now, uh, Ben yeah. Grimm. And we're only seeing his powers through news footage from a wide angle lens from a television screen that's like across the room. It's almost like looking at superpowers through on your phone or something. That's how we're experiencing Ben Grimm's powers at this point. Well, this whole section of the movie feels like it was a much longer section of the movie that got cut down and accordioned into this 20 minutes of fucking nonsense. And like, first of all, I think it's a terrible idea anyway to have them be sort of working for the government like this is just a part like this is someplace I don't want to go with these characters <laughs> and yet we're going here for whatever reason and it, none of it really makes it feels so disjointed we get this one scene here where Franklin goes to sue to convince her to find Reed and it's so obviously a reshoot scene because she's wearing this wig and she's like floating around like using she's learned to use her powers to make her a force field bubble that she can fly around in basically and this scene is so obviously thrown together in like an afternoon because they just have these like storage unit crates set up in a black room <laughs> like and you have proof because she's wearing the wig in this she's scene. she's wearing the wig it's like you can literally say, see how they just threw some shit up in the background so it wouldn't be an empty black room and just like threw together a scene in like an afternoon or whatever and God bless Kate Mara and um, John Kathy, Kathy or whatever his name is, because they're good enough actors to pull it off. But you can tell they're like, what are we doing? You can tell they literally <laughs> got handed the script like two seconds before. And we're like, huh? OK, <laughs> sure. Fine. I got to go find Reed. Like, you know, it's just this excuse to try to find Reed because Reed's off in like South America or whatever, buying parts from like. I don't know, a South American pawn shop. I don't pawn know. Pawn shop or something. Right. Or something. He's changing his face to look like he's <laughs> ethnic and buying parts for his. I don't even know what he's making. I think that was ultimately going to be the fantastic car. Oh, OK. But why was he making it? <laughs> there was a fantastic car built. There was a prop that was made and that was actually in the script for a little while. It, it wasn't later on. There's an image of it. I think on the internet, you can see like there's a green screen, there's nothing else. And there's a, a fantastic car somewhere in there you can tell, like, you can tell, like, what else is he doing with all this junk? Right. But what is he doing at all? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what he's doing at it's all. It's never explained why he's there, what he's doing, but he's buying parts. Well, he's made himself his suit. And this is the only suit that kind of speaks to what you're talking about where you see mm -hmm. he's got these sort of like rings on it it does have a little it's more crude looking because he's made it himself and it's you know it conforms to his ability to stretch it kind of accordions out and he can stretch with it it's pretty cool design like if they all the suits had had that kind of cool homemadey look i that could have worked for me you know that was definitely where they were in the beginning yeah they were more like those suits but like poor Miles Teller, I don't know if he was trying to grow a beard or something, but he's just got this really horrible patchy like fly hair beard that's not even a full beard. And they're trying to make him look grubby and he just he looks just terrible. And this whole scene doesn't make sense because he's like trying to find Ben, I guess. But why is he trying to find Ben? He knows where Ben is. And then Ben is he. I never even caught that. He, how was he trying to? It's really. Yeah, it's like he's trying to find Ben, but it makes zero sense. It's one of the most nonsensical segments of any movie I've ever seen. Like trying to figure out what's going on here is nearly impossible. What I thought was happening was he was trying to build some sort of thing to get back to the zero planet. They, they kept saying over and over again that he was going to fix Ben or he was going to help. He told Ben he'd fix it or he was going to help he'd Ben. He'd fix him. Right. He's going to help Ben. Okay. Right. So, I mean, it's a stretch. Pun intended, yeah. but, <laughs> but I, thought, um, I thought that's what he was doing. I mean, I, I guess at this like hideout, you know, where he's got like pictures somehow he's got pictures of him and Ben in childhood up on the the wall and stuff. Right? Did I, he go home and grab those? I don't know. Before escaping to the, the Amazon? 
<laughs> I don't know. But even at this moment, like, you know, we saw that he has stretched. Then we cut to him in, in Mexico. We still don't really know what it is that he does, where I think at, at this moment, we should really be discovering or he should be showcasing for the audience. Like, yes. look what I can do. Look what I've learned to do. And right. we should see, and going again, back to the fly, you know, there's a moment when Seth Brundle, how, however horrific those things were that happened to him and how grotesque his body had become. There's like a moment where he's like climbing up the wall and showing Gina Davis, mm -hmm. and look what I can do. I can yeah. scale walls now. And it's fun. And you're like with him, even in, in a horror film like that, there's a, that moment where it's like, I couldn't do this before. This is really neat. The only character we get get a little bit of that from is from uh, Johnny. We see yep. Johnny enjoying his fire powers. And he's at one point, Tim Blake Nelson is in a plane and they're flying in through the air and they see Johnny flying around. And Johnny's down for all of this. He actually wants to work for the government and do this stuff. So like he's the character that's not conflicted and is enjoying his powers because let's face it his powers are the coolest <laughs> you know <laughs> you know they try to give sue this that horrible scene where we see that she's developing her powers but yeah there's no scene like we get in spider-man where he learns he can climb walls and oh i can shoot webs and oh isn't this cool i'm gonna make a costume and you know like yeah. that's the part of the superhero film that you want to see where they discover their powers yeah, we skipped over it for Reed's character. That right. that was totally absent. Suddenly he just does this thing and it's only after the fact that we sort of see him doing, and not that much in the film. I was actually surprised at this viewing, how little we see him using his stretch powers. He barely uses them at all. Yeah. But Johnny too, it's like, it goes back to his whole like racing thing. Because yeah. he yeah. is, he's trying to be faster and faster with his new fire powers or whatever. They're like, you know, you almost got that within, you know, five seconds. And he's like, I can beat that. You know, he's, he's being challenged in that way. So it's tapping into his competitiveness with what he had with the car racing. Right. And he's an adrenaline junkie. Yes. Or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm certain that there probably was the intention to do more of that. Probably just got chopped out or rewritten but chronicle was the whole movie was kind of about that you just followed them getting more and more proficient with their abilities until it got out of control but it for most of chronicle the movie was about them having fun and playing gags on each other with their new powers you know i'm sure that was the intention uh just you know that it got completely crushed somehow in this film well, I just think they were trying to keep the running time down. I, I think they knew they had a disaster on their hands. So they're just like, we got to just keep the running time down and let's just get this all done quickly as possible. That's what I think was going on. But there is the scene where we do see what Reed can do happens when Ben confronts him. Ben is flown into Mexico or whatever to get Reed because they need Reed to fix the teleporter. So Ben shows up and they just have this really brief just fight, you know, because Ben is pissed at Reed for doing this to him because, you know, Reed was horribly irresponsible to even have Ben come along to begin with. But we see Reed do some stretching to avoid getting hit by stuff that Ben's throwing at him and stuff. Ben is kind of just a cranky curmudgeon. Ben's character, once he's the thing, is somebody you just don't want to be around yeah. every time he's on there he's just kind of grumpy i kind of almost miss like maybe he should have just been it's clobbering time you know and right. just like this boxer that was sort of a brute but he's sort of nothing in the comic book in the other versions he's bummed about his appearance because now he's a rock person but at the same time he's got that kind of like oh, i'm a working class stiff and uh, he smokes cigarettes and he's kind of i mean he smokes cigars and you know he's got a sense of humor about it and him and johnny are always giving each other a hard time but the just the version of the thing in this is so much more angsty he's miserable he's a miserable person nobody wants to see that you know so they convince reed to go back with them to fix the teleporter which they do and then they teleport back into planet zero and they find 
Uh, Doom's still alive there, and now he's, you know, he's sort of wandering these wastelands in a hood. And they bring him back, and we see that the containment suit that he was wearing melted onto him, which is vaguely giving him the appearance of Doctor Doom. In the comic books, who basically was a guy who is wearing all this armor over himself because he was horribly mutilated. This is their version of it, where he's more of like a monster that's, you know, had a suit fused onto him. It looks bad. It doesn't look <laughs> good. It's just not a very good design. I like the idea, but uh, it just looks terrible. It doesn't really look like a, a design. It looks like if you took uh, Victor and uh, like a, a figure of Victor and threw him in the microwave for 10 seconds. Or like melted crayons, melted yeah. like gray and green crayons all over him. Yeah. And like his voice doesn't even sound cool or anything. It just... And you can't see his his mouth moves. There's no facial expressions. No. He's wearing a, a melted garbage bag mask and that's it it's a really bad design i'm ready for things to wrap up at this point i was i was, re <laughs> I was ready i'm ready i'm ready to be done i'm kind of done with this movie i don't hate this movie I, there's parts of it that i really like i've already expressed that i like the cast there's things that work but at this point i'm just like yeah well, we can we can wrap it up now we can do whatever we need to do and wrap it up you must have liked the thing that happens next was when they bring victor back he they bring him back to the lab and they tr you know they try to talk to him or whatever but then he's like i'm doom now and he breaks free of the constraints they have him on and he goes on like a murder rampage where he uses his psychic powers to blow up people's heads no this actually yes uh, uh, forgive me because this actually is pretty cool and gross because he is like exploding heads in helmets too so it's like right. you're really getting that 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 yeah i i actually did enjoy that they're wearing like hazmat suits, yeah. so their their heads are like blowing up in the hazmat it's suits. It's really gross. It's it's good. Really shocking for PG thirteen. Mm -hmm. Like I'm surprised they got away with this. I watched this on Disney Plus. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so you could like go right from this to like Balto, the dog. <laughs> I think it's safe to say this might be the most horrific thing on the disney plus channel yeah it's really shockingly kind of yeah. violent yeah the other thing about where we are at this point bef even before they went and brought back victor it just seemed like there was an enormous amount of time in area 57 we're just in a gray nondescript underground bunker until they get victor and and by the way, like when, once we find out that Victor is, they bring him back, and he's got this melty look to. He's a he's a villain, and they've established he's a villain. This is at I think it, I checked the time, and it was like an hour and sixteen minutes into the movie, right? Where some movies would be over at this point. Well, and there's only twenty minutes left, yeah. So it's not like it's a two and a half hour movie where now you're going to get the second half of the movie with the villain. Yeah. It's like no, we're at the end because after he goes on this rampage, he goes back to the teleporter because his plan is he hates the world the way it is, so he's going to destroy it by like sucking it into planet zero or something. It makes no sense, but whatever. No, He's going to create none. like a vortex in the sky that's going to suck up our planet into planet zero. Don't ask me why he wants to do that. Don't ask me what's so great about planet zero. It looks like there's <laughs> literally nothing there. And I don't know how he's managed to survive for however long he's been there, but whatever, we'll let that go. <laughs> but this is what he's going to do. And he kills Franklin on the way out and like Franklin makes them promise. To Take care of each other or something like that. Right. And Victor's power is to just sort of point at people and make them melty as well. Yeah. That's his power. Which like Jen said is, is cool for a minute when he's just making people's heads explode down <laughs> yes. the hall. Right. <laughs> sort of making you check yourself that you're watching a Marvel superhero movie for a minute and you're not in some kind of strange sci-fi horror film. Which would have been great if it was a sci-fi horror film, but it's not. It's a Marvel superhero movie. Yeah. So it's just all really not working. I think he really took your uh, Cronenberg advice and went full scanners at that point, right? There was a <laughs> moment when I saw this in the theater uh, because we, we were having 
long discussions about that. And there was a moment when I was sitting in my seat going like, oh shit. <laughs> did, yeah. What have I done? Did that sink in <laughs> too deep? Am I the problem here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did I ruin Josh's career? No, there was a there was a small bit of panic that this was all your fault, Troy. <laughs> I'm just a storyboard artist. I think that's what we're really getting to here is this is all your fault, <laughs> Troy. Oh, poor Josh took all that heat. Well, unfortunately, it only gets worse from here, even though we only have 20 minutes, because the quantum teleporter gets sucked into the zero planet or something with Victor. And so to get to the zero planet, Sue just puts them all in like a bubble uh, a force field bubble <laughs> and just like flies them into the black hole, like into the planet. Like this is something like a child would come up with. Like, how do they get there? Well, Sue just puts them in a bubble and then she go. they go flying up into the sky and there's a big laser beam in the sky and they go into the laser beam and then they go into the planet. Yeah. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? It's so bad. There isn't even that sort of lazy explanation where the, very quickly she's like, well, you know, if I take the energy from Victor that he left behind and I could suddenly use that to like locate his, like there was nothing. Right. She's just like, come here guys. And grabs everybody and they fly up. Right. Like get in this bubble. Yeah. This was the part seeing it for the first time where I was like, okay, fuck this. We're, we're like, I mean, it had already been getting there. I already knew it would. It was bad up to this point. But this is where I'm like, okay, this is a disaster because this just seems like they didn't know what the fuck to do. They just have to end this stupid movie and they're going to do it however they can. Like, I don't know, throw everyone in a bubble and then they'll go up into the bubble and then go into space and then they'll come down and they go through the black hole and, you know, then they do they have to fight Victor in Planet Zero. And it's really it is the most boring rote superhero fight that possibly is in any movie, honestly. Like, it's so bad. The fight on Planet Zero is just I don't know, it's like Reed. He, he has to use his stretchy ability a little bit. You see a little bit of that. Ben picks up some rocks because he's a rock guy and <laughs> yeah, like... Sue makes some force fields and is sneak attacks because she's invisible for a second. Like that was it. At first they all try to attack Victor one on one and he defeats them by turning their powers against them. Like, you know, he makes a bunch of rocks way down Ben and then he throws some stuff on Johnny so he can't turn into fire. And then they all get together and Victor just leaves them alone at that point and like turns back to his <laughs> space laser. He's like, all right, now back to my space laser that I'm just going to stand here in front of. So then they're like, all right, guys, we really got to work as a team. And, you know, they, they, they do this half assed thing where they all come at him using their powers in a different way. And it's so unremarkable that I can't even tell you what they do. As you're describing this, I'm, I'm looking at Jen and she was like rubbing her eyes. And <laughs> just <laughs> Jen was gone by this point. She had been sucked up into the vortex and I was, was already on Jen's, another planet. I could see planet. in your camera, you're just like, why are we reliving this again? <laughs> It was just like I said, it's just, you know, it, it, I was with it. I was totally with it for a while. And then where we are now, I just was like, I just don't, I just, just don't care. Just let's just end this now. Yeah. It's just so obviously cobbled together desperately out of whatever they could do. It's so clearly the result of a troubled production that has lost its guiding force and is now being patched together by producers and people who are just trying to finish the job because there's too much money at stake to say, fuck this, let's just throw this away. You said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty unfair to the audience. Do you know what the budget of this was? It was over 200 or something, wasn't it? Well, the, the listed budget is $120 million. 
I think it's probably more than that, but that's okay. the budget that's listed. Yes. I mean, yeah. that's a lot of fucking money. I'm sure it was more because they had to do a, a bunch of reshoots and everything. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, just to wrap up the movie as perfunctorily as it wraps up, Victor is defeated. They defeat him. They gang up and defeat him. And then they go back to Earth. And for whatever reason, the government agrees to let them have their own facility and in the comics, they get a building in the middle of New York City called the Baxter Building, and it's this fixture of the Marvel Universe. But in this, they just give them this giant facility somewhere else. Well, because we started at the Baxter Building. That's where he got right, his scholarship right. to. So we already we had already seen the Baxter Building, and it blew. Did it blow up? Did it blow up? I don't remember. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess they need a new building because they had already sort of pissed away the Baxter building. That's like making a Han Solo movie where you're building up to him getting the Millennium Falcon and at the end he just gets some other ship. Like, like you know, we've got a really great ship for you, Han Solo. And you're like, oh, it's going to be the Millennium Falcon. And then they're like, and it's this ship that's not the Millennium Falcon. It's got room for two people in it. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, what? It should be the Millennium Falcon. Like, you don't give me this piece of crap. So that... that their new building is was just basically a museum that they found in Baton Rouge that they could just go to and shoot them walking around in it real quickly. Right. And they have this really painful last moment where they're all standing on a balcony looking down at the production floor where they're going to let them make, I don't know, quantum teleporters or whatever the fuck they're going to let them make. And they're like, what should we call ourselves? Oh, that, and like, oh, it's no. just so bad. I think this was the most painful part is after we kind of went through this very catastrophic <laughs> disaster train wreck of the uh, this supposed to be epic battle. And then they're like, now what do we call ourselves? And they try to do some jokes. There's no chemistry between Torch them. and the Torchettes. And they, yeah. Oh, oh. It's just sad. <laughs> It's like dad jokes. It's like they had their dads or the writers had their dads write it or something. It's just so poor and bad and it feels so painful. And, yeah. you know, you've just gone through this painful experience and then they're trying to do this and you're like, oh. And they're not they're not even really in the new space. They're just standing at a, in a green screen. They're standing at right. like a green screen with a composite of the space in front of them. And they're like, look at that cool space. That area is mine over there. We're not going to go there. But. For some reason, I feel the worst for Kate Mara because I feel like she's just looking like, please just get me out of this wig and get me back to the set of House of Cards or whatever the fuck else she was doing at this time. Like, please just get me out of here. Oh, this is pain. Like, you can see the pain on her face. Yeah. Thankfully, Jamie Bell, who's an actor I really like, isn't really there because he's a CGI creature. So he got off the best. <laughs> he was probably like, oh, thank God. I didn't have to be standing there. I hope he didn't do mocap for this because if he did, like what a waste of his time. You know, the, the thing just moves like dunk, dunk, dunk. <laughs> like there's no movement to the character. And he's like a dancer. He became. Oh, that's right. He's he was Billy uh, Elliot. Billy Elliot. That's right. I'm mm -hmm. sure they did put him in the mocap suit because he's a dancer. That's sure. why they got him to do it. Because they're like, let's get somebody who's really knows how to move. move. And, then, and then they make this rock creature that doesn't fucking move hardly. <laughs> Ugh, what a disaster. I think this was universally how this was received. But I do think you're right that it, it, uh, it had a lot going against it to begin with. I think people had knives out and were ready yep. to go after it. And then unfortunately, I just think that because Josh wasn't allowed to put forth the vision he wanted to, it ended up being terrible because it was neither nothing. I, I'll say this for other productions on this scale when, in, you know, up and coming directors are are snatched and brought in to to helm something that is larger than life like this. You know, Gareth Edwards apparently had a an experience on Rogue One uh, where things weren't going the way they wanted to. But you're put in a position where you're either going to get in the passenger seat or you're going to get fired. Right. You know, and 
we've seen directors get fired off of projects that are, were going totally in a, the wrong direction. Uh, Solo was the other one where, you know, it's just like, this is not, okay, stop, put the brakes on. This is going totally in the wrong direction. Like I said, you have a choice to ride with that. And, you know, by the end of it, you get your name on the movie, you have a career, or you can fight it because you feel like you want to establish your vision. And it's tricky. People are in contracts. I feel bad that this happened to uh, to Josh, who had made this incredible film and then was given the golden keys to the castle. I think he really, from what I saw in there, he really was trying to hold tight to the reins and push his vision that that he wanted to. You know, I think there's, we hear less about the stories of when directors are just sort of told to uh, keep a lid on it and yeah. get in the passenger seat and just let the production go the way that the studio wants it to. Right. Well, and clearly he didn't do that. Clearly that moment had come at some point during the production and he did not want to get in the passenger seat. So he just sort of checked out. And I mean, from what, uh, you know, I, I wasn't there, you weren't there, so no. we can't say I can't for sure. say, but there's, you know, you can go online and there's all kinds of stories floating around online as to how the production went and how he was handling it. He basically, from what I understand, checked out and just didn't show up to work after a while. And Simon Kinberg had to come in and really take over. And then Simon Kinberg went on to do a couple of the X-Men movie. He did that last X-Men movie, and that's terrible too. So he's not a good director. So like the guy that came in and took over for Josh is a bad director. So now you yeah. have a bad director who's really a producer taking over and making this mishmash Frankenstein movie, which doesn't serve anybody. Why do studios bring people in with this, wave this carrot in front of them, telling them they can do what they want, when they really don't have any intention of letting them do what they want. That's exactly right. Yeah. Again, I think it's just that there was a, a lot of buzz and there was a lot of excitement. And Chronicle was kind of this this new vision. It was a different take on things. And they had this property that they were obviously not just going to create a, uh, a carbon copy of what Marvel Studios was had already established they needed to take a spin on it and and try to have you know this uh, you see that you saw that in venom you know when it's like let's make a more rated r superhero movie let's just take this and try to do something a little different with it and initially i think that was the idea and um i i'm guessing that they got cold feet once that actually started to happen there's probably all kinds of other things in there as far as, you know, egos and differences of opinion. When you have too many, too many chefs in the kitchen, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different uh, ideas of as to different, you know, different visions. But yeah, you can see it. You can see everything happening on screen. Like we were saying, especially, you know, once you're in the, the middle of the movie and there's just things are not connecting you're just seeing bits and pieces of different things that were supposed to happen or didn't happen. And they're putting them in there or they're erasing them. And this is a kind of right. a case study in not, I think like not putting on the brakes, like what was done with solo, for example, and just saying, let's, okay, let's reset. Let's uh, bring in somebody. They're going to control it. Just one person. We're going to give it to a seasoned writer director and just finish this fucking thing. All right, well, I'm going to finish this fucking thing by getting in my containment suit and making myself a nice force field bubble and riding that shit all the way to the phantom dimension. <laughs> do you want Do you want another screenwriter to come in and, and rewrite that? Do you got Simon Kinberg's number? <laughs> That about does it today for Tentpole Trauma. If you like what you heard, check out our social media presence on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just look for Tentpole Trauma. That was easy, wasn't it? If you like us, hit subscribe and leave us a sterling review on iTunes, if you dare. 
If you really like us, head over to Patreon.com and get involved in one of our fabulous tiers. You'll be glad you did. Want to communicate with Tentpole Trauma? Send an email to tentpoletrauma at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And who knows, one day you may even get your email read on one of our shows. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you real soon. Thank you.